The Starting Cast, episode 266 for Monday, May 21st, 2012. Archimedes. Welcome to Astronomy Cast, our weekly facts-based journey through the cosmos, where we help you understand not only what we know, but how we know what we know. My name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of University Today, and with me is Dr. Pamela Gay, a professor at Southern Illinois University, Evansville. Hey, Pamela, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Uh, we're fresh off of our most recent virtual star party, which was a lot of fun. We had uh, a lot of the great summer constellation objects starting to, to show up now. And I think if people haven't had a chance, we connect up a whole bunch of telescopes every Sunday night as soon as it gets dark on the west coast. So in the summertime, that's around 9. West in coast of North America. Yeah. The West Coast of North America, <laughs> the West, yeah, the West Coast of Australia, no, the West Coast of North America, um, because we've got some great telescopes on the West Coast, and so around nine Pacific or so, we start we start going in the summertime. In the winter time, it's more like five Pacific, and uh, and then we just run the telescopes for a couple of hours. We take requests, whatever you want to see, and then Pamela or Phil stop by, and we explain the science, and it's a it's a really good time. So if you want to, you know, we're trying to use this new media, this new technology in interesting ways and um, we've been really well aware that the big problem with astronomy cast is that it's just audio and so if we can actually the why not incorporate the video and so we live stream telescopes right onto the internet we take requests it's awesome and, and if you want to find out about the when the virtual star parties are going to happen and all the other video things that Fraser and I are putting out there on the internet go to cosmoquest.org sign up for an account and sign up to get our newsletter and every Sunday Monday, if you're in the Pacific Rim, um, you'll end up getting a newsletter that lists all the times and all the different things that we're up to. So, for instance, the newsletter that went out last night talked about how myself and noisy astronomer Nicole Gallucci are both going to be at the amazing meeting, and we're hoping to meet up with you. Oh, I'm going to miss the amazing meeting this year. That sounds great. All right. Well, then, let's get, let's get rolling. So, here we go. Um, so, it's time to look deep into history to the birthplace of modern mathematics ancient Greece, and one of the most famous mathematicians of the time was Archimedes. We use many of his mathematical theories and inventions to this day, while others, not so much. They're steeped in legend and mystery. So, so Pamela, do you have like a whole section of, of when you're teaching people when you just go through some of the Archimedes principles? Um, it's more a matter of they keep randomly cropping up depending on what I'm teaching. So when I'm teaching freshman physics, uh, he crops up all through um, it, different things that we're trying to understand. So when we start talking about um, basic machines, he came up with the simple Archimedes screw, which was used to raise water. Um, and you can also use it to raise stuff. Um, then there's, he comes up when people start grouching about having to use calculus because he really is the father of the ideas behind calculus even if he's not the one who developed calculus. Uh, then when we're talking about the initial measurements of distance to the moon, he didn't do that but he wrote about uh, what was done by Aristarchus. So he just keeps cropping up as this 300 years before Jesus guy who was doing amazing modern mathematics. Yeah, and, they, and also uh, for people who want to build death rays, he comes Well, up. yes, there's that too. That, that's actually one of the more awesome things that he may or may not have done. Yeah, I think the Mythbusters have, have taken a real crack at trying to figure out if he had done it. But we'll get to that in a, in, a, in a little bit. So then who was Archimedes and sort of when did he live? So, so he lived uh, about 300 years BC. 287 BC is is given as um, his birth year, roughly. Um, died roughly 212 BC. Um, actually, lived to be an old man by the standards of the time. He lived to be about 75, which didn't usually happen back then. And one of the, the sadnesses is he didn't actually die of old age. He died. Uh, by annoying a, a, a soldier, basically. There, there's a couple of different stories about his death. Um, it, it's generally agreed that he, he died when the city of um, Syracuse was captured during the Second Punic War, and that the general who captured the city, Marcus Claudius Marcellus, um, had ordered that, that he was not to be harmed. He, he was seen as a scientific mathematical resource that was to be protected, um, sort of like a lot of the German rocket scientists in World War II were protected. Um, 
But depending on whose story you read, the soldier who came across him either found him doing mathematics in the sand. It, this was in the days before whiteboard. You used what you had. In his case, sand was the moral equivalent of a whiteboard. And um, according to one story, he was working figures in the sand. And the soldier said, come with me, and was going to take him to the general. And, and he said, no, 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 I need to finish the calculation I'm doing. And so the soldier killed him. Um, according to the other story, the mathematical instruments that he had with him um, were seen as being either of value or dangerous, and he was killed for the mathematical instruments that he had. In either case, um, the, the general, Marcellus, was rather annoyed at the soldier because he was a valuable protected resource that was killed essentially for no reason. A little old doddering man who basically mouthed off to a soldier. You can just imagine, I don't know, that'd be like an episode of the Big Bang Theory. You know, you can imagine. <laughs> you can because, see Sheldon doing right? that. Yeah, because he was just like he was just like a like a quintessential, clearly a quintessential math geek, and he was like, no, no, I got to finish my calculation. Yeah. You know, when it, when a soldier, upon threat of death, was telling him <laughs> to come along, most people down. would come along. But no, Archimedes had to finish his calculation. Clearly, he had some ideas that he had to get out of his head. Okay, so so that was how he lived and he died. Yeah. But there had to be some interesting stuff in the middle. So so where did he sort of? get started. And I know the big problem with a lot of these these scientists from antiquity is that there's just so little information on them. Yeah, so so we don't know a lot about him. Luckily he, he was uh, written about a bit by Plutarch. Um, he he um, did a lot of his own writing and so while we don't know the day-to-day -day details, we don't know if he had kids, we don't know if he was even married, we, we don't know any of those, we do know a lot about um, who he corresponded with based on his writings. So it, it's imagined that he might have uh, studied in Alexandria of Egypt um, because of correspondence he had with Conan of Samoas and um, Erastathenes of Cyrene. Um, so the fact that he was corresponding with these people as friends leads many to think, well, per perhaps he studied with them in Alexandria. Um, it's a guess. We do know that he spent significant portions of his life in Syracuse uh, on the island of, of Sicily um, and that he was one of the most renowned both mathematicians and builder of random things. And, and I think it's the building of random things and the solving of random problems that relied on both experiment and mathematics that he gets remembered for. Um, lots of people have seen the various cartoons of a, a naked Archimedes springing out of the bath with a king's crown. It's a cartoon. The king's crown was not in the bath with him. Um, because he, he was given the task of determining if a crown the king had made uh, was made of pure gold or not. And, and trying to figure out how to do this short of melting the crown was a bit problematic. But he, he is um, supposedly the person who, while in the bath, thinking, realized as he moved and the water level moved, that water is for the most part an uncompressible fluid. And so if you take something and it submerges completely in the water, the amount of water displaced is going to give you the volume of the object. And based on the volume and the weight of the object, you can measure its density. If you can measure its density, you can figure out if it's made of pure gold or not, because pure metals, each pure metal has a different density. And sure enough, it turned out the crown was polluted with silver. So his eureka moment, where he's said to have sprung out of the bath naked, screaming eureka, um, no one knows if that's true or not. But we now torture all good first-year physics students with repeating Archimedes experiments. You, like give them a crown, put them in the bath, and tell them to determine if it's pure gold or not? It, it's usually not a crown. It's, yeah, it's usually a series of small cylinders of pure metals and, and a graduated cylinder. And you say, here are these metals. Figure out what they are. Here's a periodic table. You're on your own. And uh, they have to use Archimedes' principle to measure the density of these different objects and then determine what are they. And so, just to sort of explain to people who perhaps uh, have never done this, you would take these these cylinders of metal, you would put them in the water, and you would be able to determine how much water they displace based on their density. 
Yes. Well, it, it, you also have to weigh them. Um, it's so so right. it, they displace a given volume. Now, now the other thing that comes out of this is he also figured out the buoyancy principle. So you figure out the density of something that's able to fer to completely submerge by measuring it, its mass, and um, then measuring how much water is displaced. This gets you the density. Now, the other thing you can do is he figured out that the mass of the water displaced by a boat or something else that's floating is equal to the mass that, that is doing the floating bit. And, and so this is the buoyancy principle. So if you have a giant steel ship, the reason it's able to, to float is because it's displacing a given amount of water. And the water's pushing on it, and it's pushing on the water. And um, it's, it, it all works out with the buoyancy force. Right, that the overall density of the ship, when you include all the air that's inside, is mm -hmm. still going to be lower than the density of water, and so it's more buoyant than the water that floats up on top. And, and water weighs a remarkable 62 pounds per cubic foot. So um, that means you take a, a, a area that is the size of your standard floor tile and cube it, so you have a three-dimensional square that would fit on that standard floor tile. And that small volume of water weighs about half as much as your standard teenage girl. And <laughs> so you have a vast amount of water, um, a vast amount of weight in water, and you don't have to displace a lot of water to float a human or even to float a ship. And not to sort of go to Mythbusters too often, but didn't they even like make a ship out of concrete? And, yeah, they did. Know, that was they made, kind of or awesome. Or stone. Awesome. They made a ship out of stone. Yeah, anyway. The they point made being one out of cement. That, out of cement, yeah. The yeah. point being that you can, and that's how you can do it with steel, right? The point yeah. is as long as the overall density of what it is that you're working with is lower than the density of the water, the whole thing is going to float, as long as the water yeah. doesn't get in. As soon as the water and gets in, then... That, then it's going to sink. And building cement canoes is kind of a standard thing to ask civil engineers to do because it's fun to torture them, plus cement's fun to play with. That's cool. Um, right, so, so I think, you know, if there's anything to take away from, it's this whole concept of Archimedes' principle. And really, if you've gone, you've taken any math, any science, any physics, you will have run up against this, and you will have done the calculations to determine the amount of uh, uh, sort of the density of various objects. And this is used all the time even in astronomy. I mean, astronomers right. are calculating the density of, of planets, of stars. Or, or to, more to the point, we, we, are, are much, we use the buoyancy principle, which you came up with, for those uh, stratospheric balloons that people are using to send Camilla the chicken up to outer space and to send all sorts of scientific payloads up to that boundary between the atmosphere and space. Balloons are held up by the buoyancy principle because the inside of the balloon is made of a lower density material than the outside of the balloon or the air surrounding the balloon so they're able to float up. Sometimes it's something as simple as having a hotter gas and hotter gases have a um, lower density so it's able to be supported by the buoyant force. Sometimes it's a matter of using hydrogen or helium as the gas inside the balloon. So different balloons work in different ways. All of them are supported by the buoyancy force. All of them are able to carry payloads up, whether it be a human being taking photos or a uh, camera setup that's traveling to the boundary between atmosphere and space. Now, we, now, he was sort of most famously known for the Archimedes principle, but he was able to, you know, we've mentioned this, he sort of liked to play in almost every area, so he also worked on a lot of engineering type tasks as well, and I think one of the most famous things from there is, is the, the Archimedes screw. Right, so this is, if, if you've never been to a science museum, this is your excuse for going, because most science museums will actually have a hand-on demo where you can turn a screw and it raises fluid up. Um, it's, it's just this neat system where it turns out that when you run a inclined plane that's shaped like a screw through fluid, the fluid will get carried up the inclined plane. It's 
just one of those awesome, wow, how did he figure it out? I have no clue how he figured it out. It was one of those moment of genius things that he did. He, he's also famous for figuring out levers, which seems like a really lame thing, but he was the person who figured out that if you want to lift a heavier object, you just need a longer lever arm, and that's the whole concept of with a long enough lever arm, you can move the planet Earth. Which is true, except you need some place to put the lever. But right, and, and then you also have to figure out, well, what force is it that you're trying to displace, and that gets a little bit trickier. But yeah, it's, it's entirely true. You could do it with a bunch of caveats. Right, and so just if, if, if you've never seen an Archimedes screw, this is an idea. You've got like a cylinder, and inside the cylinder you've got a screw, like a great big screw bit, and then as you, and then a handle on the top, and as you yeah. turn this, the screw in the water, the water just moves up the cylinder and pours out the top. And this is a way that they were able to pull water out of wells and out of uh, rivers and stuff from a lower level to a higher yeah. level. Just an amazing technology. You can imagine, you know, it saved you having to drop buckets down, had to, there's the kind of thing you could hook up animals to and be able to turn it and water just poured out the top. Well, and, and unlike buckets, it's a continuous flow of fluid. So one, one of the more useful ways of using it was just to raise river water, river water up a hill. So, so you can imagine you have the nice incline and then you have oxen at the top that are through a set of gears turning your screw with you and you're able to irrigate your fields. Yeah, that, that probably would have been a huge... You could see why the general would have, would have wanted him kept alive. Yeah. You know, those kinds of ideas coming out of him. So... Um, so now, I think the other thing that Archimedes was really famous for was a lot of his work with circles and spheres and, he know, was, and um, the math and the underlying math involved. He was an insane mathematician. Um, there, there's a process that is called either the method of exhaustion or brute force, which, which is a way of, of solving math problems by basically doing a bazillion little tiny calculations. Um, when you're first learning calculus, one of the things that they teach you is the area underneath a curve um, can be solved for by treating it as a whole bunch of little tiny rectangles and adding all of those little tiny rectangles together. Archimedes is the person you have to blame for that. I remember that. <laughs> And, and so he used this brute force summation technique to get at the areas under curves uh, to start to figure out the volumes of rotated curves, uh, rotated volumes. Um, he, he set out to, to figure out all sorts of volumes that nowadays we, we happily solve using calculus. And, and because he did his brute force mechanisms, he was able to come up with fairly accurate values of pi. I mean, you can't come up with a completely accurate unless you have infinite time value, but he came out with a fairly precise value of pi. Um, and the thing he did that he was actually most proud of, and the fact that he did it without calculus, I, kudos, uh, he was able to figure out that the volume and surface area of a sphere inscribed within a cylinder is two-thirds of that of the cylinder. So this means that if you take a sphere and you put it in a cylinder where the diameter of the cylinder is the same as the diameter of the sphere and the height of the cylinder is the same as the height of the sphere, then the area including the caps of the, of the, the cylinder is going to be larger than that of the sphere such that the sphere is two-thirds. And it works for both area and volume, which is just one of those neat little parallels that, it, that it, someone working in ancient Greek, Greece could totally get behind. So he actually, when he died, it was at his request, there was a statue of, of the sphere within the cylinder as, as part of his burial. That would be a very difficult statue to build. Yeah, I, I was actually really hoping as I was researching the show that I could find a picture of it, but it turns out that his tomb has been lost, and, and it was one of those moments of, huh, that's bizarre, because they thought they had found it in the 1960s, and then they misplaced it. And, and the fact that it got misplaced in modern times is something that highly disturbs me. But if you've ever got to travel through Greece or Italy, you're wandering around and everywhere you look, there's bits of ancient stuff. And you can sort of imagine someone needs to build a building and, and they have to get rid of the ancient stuff. And, and so I, I fear that overpopulation um, is, is slowly going to 
remove records of lots of really awesome old stuff. So let's talk a couple about a couple of his inventions and ideas that maybe weren't quite so based in reality and maybe was a little more myth and legend that could perhaps have been busted recently. Well, I, I, think, I think you're getting at the idea that um, you could use mirrors to set flame to ships. What, one of the, the great um, weapons of mass destruction of ancient Greece that, that Archimedes was... Um, given credit for was using mirrors to set fire to ships. The idea was you get a bunch of soldiers along the shore, they all have parabolic mirrors, they point their parabolic mirrors at the ship, ship combusts. And there's been a couple of different tests on this. So the, the first test that, that was done on this um, was done in 1973. It was a Greek scientist, Ionis Sakis. I'm sorry, I'm mispronouncing that. Um, and and it took place outside of Athens, so they had the sun at the same attitude that you would have, altitude rather, that you'd have it at. Um, they used 70 mirrors. They were fairly large mirrors. They were 1.5 by 1 meter in size, so uh, more than my arm span wide probably, and, and uh, twice, yeah, it, they, were, they were big. Um, so 1.5 by 1 meter. 1 meter is... is 36 inches or so. Um, so these were hard to hold, hard to manufacture, but they did everything they could to make them authentic. These were copper coated, um, and they pointed all of these large mirrors at a plywood mock-up, and the plywood mock-up um, very quickly at a distance of 160 feet uh, caught on fire. So, so using these large mirrors, a fairly small distance, 160 feet, 50, mirrors, 50 meters, about half a football field, they were able to set the boat on fire. Now, Mythbusters came along and tried to replicate this, but they opted to use much smaller mirrors. Um, and then they put the ship at a greater distance. And they found that after about 10 minutes, they were able to get everything focused together, everything not moving, perfect weather conditions, they were able to get smoldering and a little bit of flames. So when you make it a slightly more realistic idea, um, it, it appears that maybe it doesn't work so well. And then when they repeated this again on Mythmusters a second time um, with an even more realistic, greater distance to the boat, they, they couldn't even with 500 school children be able to get things on fire. So it appears that Archimedes might have been able to set things on fire if they were like almost on top of, of the harbor. Um, and the mirrors were really big and the weather was perfect. Um, and the other caveat was it had to be happening near dawn, early morning because the, where the sun was relative to the harbor. Mythbusters considers it busted. Um, has guessed that likely what was actually happening was they were blinding people on the boat, shining mirrors into their face. Um, and flaming arrows are a whole lot easier to use to set fire to boats. So you can imagine someone getting blinded by a mirror, and then all of a sudden their boat sets on fire. So you blame the mirror when really it was a flaming arrow. arrow. But I think actually shooting uh, or you know, using the mirrors to blind people would actually be pretty effective when you think about it because you wouldn't be able to really get a sense of, of where the troops are on the land, where to, yeah. where to land. So if you just set up some, some people, maybe some non-combatants with these mirrors to, to blind people, that might be a fairly effective way to, to keep people, and um, at least add a little more confusion to the invasion. And if you think about it, if, if they were attacking at dawn, they were attacking with the idea of having the sun behind them to, bl to blind the people they're attacking. So it's the exact same strategy on both sides. One side is using the mirror to blind people, and the other side is just using direct sunlight to blind people. Yeah. Um, and now the other thing that he created was the, uh, the claw. Have you heard about this, the Archimedes claw? No, that one I don't know about. It was, a, it was like a crane that could be used to kind of grab a ship and, and pull it out of the water as it was attacking. So 
Um, you know, and that people have again tried to test that out and see. There was a show, it was like Super Weapons of the Ancient World or something like that, and they tested out building an, an Archimedes Claw, and uh, and they thought, yeah, maybe, maybe it might work, but it would have to be, again, it would have to be really close, right? You'd have to have this gigantic yeah. boom arm that would reach out and you would grapple and the can't ship. can't you just, like, sail out of reach of something like that? It well, wouldn't uh, the, really be all that stealthy. Well, I think it's not about selfies. The point is that as you're about, these people are, are about to land, about to invade, you mess up their ship. But yeah. I, it, it just, I don't know, it doesn't sound like it would, would have been the best, the best way to go about it. Now, now, one of the things that we've always gone with was we try to, ba- balance, try to match up the, the scientists and their associated mission. So has there been a mission for Archimedes? You know, the ESA websites left me confused on this point. There is, in the late 80s and up until 1992, a bunch of references, even in books, to the ESA, European Space Agency, um, Archimedes Satellite Network, which was a network of satellites that had uh, highly elliptical orbits that were going to be used uh, to do telecommunications in Europe. and and these are extremely useful because while they're going over the northern polar regions and sending signals to Scandinavia and other northern extremes that are kind of hard to get signals from geostationary satellites to, they're moving at near geostationary rates. And then they zip out and they move quickly on on their far out elliptical parts and then very slowly swing by again. So so this is a technique that's been used by the Russians and been used by others. but then I could never figure out if they launched the sucker. There, there's no references to it past 1992 that I was able to find. So I think this is a mission that didn't make it into existence. Um, what was fun, though, is I found references to trials that were the Eureka mission. So there, there's clearly some humor involved. Um, there's lots of books talking about this model. There's some journal articles. Can't figure out if it was launched or not. Hmm. Uh, well, I know the. I mean, the Europeans launched their Galileo constellation. Yeah. Right. Isn't it the Galileo? I think so. Anyway, there is communications there going is, on in Europe. There, there is, and no, no, but there's a GPS system that's being developed by the Europeans. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, no, this the, this was supposed the, to be more the like constellation. I'm sure yeah, someone in the chat will, will will mention it to me. But yeah. Um, Sorry, so, so, sorry. So, so, this is one of the mysteries. Yeah, yeah, one of the mysteries. Okay. Now, was there anything else we want to talk about Archimedes while we're sort of loving the show? He is the father of brute force mathematics that we torture high school students with. And that is just kind of awesome. He left behind a series of books. And what's kind of amazing is... Um, because so much has been lost in the 2,300 years since he worked, um, we don't even know if, if we lost more than we kept. Um, so just imagine if, if, if the libraries in Alexandria had never been burned. Imagine if more texts had made it into the future. Um, I, I think the only thing that we've left out so far is uh, one of the perfect spirals is, is the Archimedes spiral. This is a spiral that is formed when you have something that is rotating at a constant rate and moving away from the circle at a constant rate. And in polar coordinates, which is a way to define um, mathematics when things are moving around an axis in a symmetric way, um, it's a nice, clean uh, equation where... Um, the distance that you're at is equal to A plus B theta, uh, where A is a constant that defines um, how wide it ends up being, and B tells how quickly it's rotating. Um, So he he defined a spiral, and that's kind of cool. And I know he also left a bunch of mysteries, too. He he came up with a whole bunch of of mysteries, like, um, what were they... Uh, he, he wrote a bunch of, I guess, a bunch of books, right? He measured on yeah. the measure of the circle, on spirals, on the sphere and the cylinder, on floating bodies. And so this is where a lot of these, these books that came to us uh, today. And then he, he left a bunch of problems as well. Um, 
Uh, in one, he tried to count the number of grains of fan sand that would fit yeah. inside the universe. Um, uh, trying to count the number of cattle in a herd. So uh, he left a bunch of really interesting work. And I guess this was, you know, I wonder how much of, this, of his stuff might have been burned in the Library of Alexandria and how much of it remained. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to tell. All we know is we've lost a lot of volumes. And imagine if he'd lived after we knew about calculus. He was already trying to do all sorts of problems that require uh, summations, that require set theory, that, that require a whole lot of complex ways of dealing with large numbers. And, and he came so close to discovering calculus and I just was stopped at summation. That. You know, there's so many times when there are these, these calculations, these discoveries, or even, you know, people are really close to even things like understanding how the human, you know, how the human circulatory system works, yeah. or the germ theory, or... Atomic uh, theory with his grains of sand yeah. idea. Yeah, or, or in this case, you know, you can imagine that, that he had gotten that close to calculus. Well, what happened if they had been doing calculus 2,000 years ago? Would that have changed anything? So I always wonder if some of these just these yeah. discoveries that, that almost they didn't require any specific time. You know, some of the modern stuff, you needed the, ma the materials and the, and the equipment and the scientific discoveries to be able to even make these further discoveries. But there's a lot of stuff that is just a, you know, evolution. You just had to realize the way the world yeah. worked, and then you could, could make the discovery at almost any time. I think and you needed a fossil record to get to evolution, so that required a little bit of geology. No, but it, but it wasn't, I mean, they, they could have been geologists 2,000 years ago, right? They no, could have been digging true. through the, the rock layers and finding all of these dinosaurs. In fact, they might have been while they were building the pyramids. Who knows? <laughs> but, so I wonder if, you know, some of these discoveries were made multiple times, and it's just, it, you know, it never stuck until yeah. almost like the modern invention of the way the communication and the way the scientific method is maintained and communicated and the way the research is done that now, now none of these discoveries are, are going to ever be lost. But a long time ago, people were making these discoveries, and then they were getting lost. So well, yeah, and, and it's, it's terrifying to think how much knowledge was lost between the burning of Alexandria and the Dark Ages when knowledge was suppressed. Um, it, it was the, the Arabic nations that, that really cherished science and, and knowledge, and um, it, we, we basically have the Muslim Middle East to thank for the fact that algebra survived. Yeah. and um, so many other different records that would have been lost had they not protected them. Yeah. All right, well, thanks once again, Pamela, and we will see you next week. See you later, Fraser. Okay. So save. everyone stick around. We're just going to save and make sure that we don't lose this, which has been known to happen. Yes. Quitting GarageBand. Save a wave file. Done. Not done. Ten seconds done, and that's bulletproof. So, so as always, uh, if you have any questions for me and Pamela, go ahead and post them. You can post your question in the Google Plus feed. You can post them over on YouTube if you're watching this. You can also post it on Twitter with the hashtag AstronomyCast, and we will pick it up, and we will answer as many questions as we can until, I don't know, until you roast <laughs> yeah, I'm air slowly melting. Yeah. Yeah, so so we're really sorry that we started this recording a little bit late today, but um, our air conditioning went out Friday night. It was one of these horrible things of you come home and, and these things always wait till Friday to happen. And the downstairs smelt slightly burnt, the upstairs spent, smelled more burnt, and the temperature was rising and um, yeah, when we tried to reboot the air conditioning unit it said no. And, and um, yeah, so they, they removed the motor from our air conditioning system. And we live in a very old house, and I don't know how old the air conditioning is, but it definitely looks like first-generation air conditioning. And um, so we, we are now enjoying. I, I, pretty close, pretty close. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got a question here from uh, Fee Finn. Um, which is, why does Titan have an atmosphere when Mars doesn't? That's one of those really confusing things. Um, it, it's a combination of it's really cold, 
So the particles are moving at a lower velocity. One of the things that causes Mars to not have an atmosphere is you have particles moving at a fairly good rate. When they collide into one another, the really lightweight particles, so you're looking here at hydrogen, helium, oxygen, nitrogen, when these lightweight atoms collide into one another, they hit escape velocity, fly away. On Titan, things are much colder, so you have a molecular atmosphere. Molecules weigh more, they're moving slower because of the, the temperatures being lower, so it's harder for them to hit escape velocity. But there's still this perplexing problem of, well, why isn't the sun's ultraviolet radiation tearing apart a lot of these molecules? And it appears that the atmosphere of Titan's constantly being refurbished by the planet outgassing, and we don't understand that problem. Um, so, so it's a combination of it's cold, the constituent particles in the atmosphere are big, but they should still be flying off eventually, and they're not, which means they're getting refurbished by something. Now, is the fact that, that Titan is further away from the sun and sort of receiving less radiation from the sun and less of its solar wind, would that be contributing to a slower that, loss that rate? That helps, but it's still getting pretty tortured by various pro processes uh, as it goes in and out of, of radiation belts and things like that. Um, the environment of Saturn isn't isn't entirely kind. Um, it's not as bad as Jupiter where, where you have Io getting <laughs> bad yeah. things happening. Um, but yeah, it's further out. It doesn't have the same radiation pressure on it, but there's still something going on that's refurbishing that atmosphere. And it was, is it possible there's something in the environment of Saturn itself? I mean, I know that that Enceladus and Rhea, you know, they're all spewing out particles, they think. And right. so, you know, could, could Titan, as sort of one of the larger gravitational objects, pick, be picking these up? It, it can, st well, it, it's not grabbing particles out of the rings. Um, it's, it's, that no, is... No, no rings, just in, the, just in the overall environment. It, it, no, it, it's something internal to Titan that's spewing out the methane that we just haven't figured out, some sort of a geological process internal to Titan itself. Right. Uh, so Thad Sabo said, just back to the uh, sort of density of water, that if you take a meter stick cubed, uh, that is as much volume as a small car. Yeah. Yeah, water is heavy too. Um, so Hugo is mentioning that the, the, the show is failing for him after a little while. So if you're having trouble with watching it on Google+, you might want to try watching it over on YouTube, although it really it's the same stream. So I'm not sure why it's, it's, it's cutting off for you. I'm not really sure. Could be the speed of your connection. I'm not really yeah. sure. Um, and then you can always watch it after the fact, and then you can watch the archive version, which should work. Um... Let's see. So Todd Howard wonders, would it be correct to say that an aircraft propeller or fan blades are essentially a cutback version of Archimedes' screw? Sort of. Because I mean, I think part of, the, I mean, part of the problem with Archimedes' screw is that you've got this the cylinder around it that's 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 keeping the liquid in, and then you're just turning it. Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> It's similar, but, but the physics of, of those things is actually far more complicated than your average physics 101 book tries to portray. Right. Um, so okay. related physics, not uh, identical physics. Right, yeah, of a, of a, of a screw-shaped object turning a liquid or an, or an air. Um, Rich Hayward asks, might we already be traveling to other stars? You're going to need more information, Rich, about what you're getting at. Um, yeah. So, are we traveling to other stars right now? I guess. We're traveling towards other stars and away from other stars, at just in our movement through the Milky Way, but not in any kind of time frame that we would find uh, in any way interesting. It would take us hundreds of millions of years to reach some other stars. And we're not star. getting close enough to have fun. Yeah. All right. Um... Nick uh, Hugel asks, now that the Chinese space station is manned, will it orbit get near the ISS at any time, and do you think they'll chat with each other via radio? 
So it's probably on a completely different orbit than the ISS. It's on a completely different orbit, and the chatting back and forth, I think, is somewhat limited by language, and um, I'm not quite sure why they would Just do use it. the Internet. Yeah, just e exactly. Use, just use, you know, have a Google Hangout. Well, it, it, yeah, bandwidth back and forth is a little limited. But theoretically, that's how you would do it. I mean, I guess, I don't know. I mean, I know that a lot of the, the astronauts on board the space station are amateur ham radio enthusiasts, yeah. too, and a lot of times amateurs actually have communicated with them via ham radio. So yeah. maybe the Chinese astronauts are ham radio enthusiasts, too. I'm not sure. I don't know. One, one of the big concerns about letting them talk is there's actually a lot of moratoriums on what we're allowed to do with China. Um, I'm not going to get into the right or wrong of this. I just know that it, it's stuff that I have to deal with because of my NASA work. Um, there, there's actually a line item congressional thing that states no NASA money can be used to travel to China. So this summer, the International Astronomical right. Union meeting is going to be in Beijing, and there's lots of scientists who work for NASA who are unable to attend because all of their funding comes from NASA. Um, I'm actually going to be traveling using university funding that, that is state of Illinois and thus not dealing with federal mandates. Um, and there's also a lot of what are called ITAR restrictions. These are restrictions that forbid the export of a lot of different technologies to foreign countries. And um, one of the reasons China had to build its own space station was U.S. ITAR restrictions prevent Chinese from ever being on the International Space Station. So I'm, I'm not sure what the restrictions would even be on allowing them to communicate back and forth. Now, we've actually got the Chinese Space Agency on our list of show topics, so at some yes. point I think we'll, we'll definitely want to talk about that, because I mean, a lot of that stuff is really interesting, just not only the accomplishments they've made so far, the, the plans that they've stated, yes. but also the, com the complicated geopolitics that are connected to them being able to to be doing space exploration. Yeah, and they, they have the educated population, they have the industrial industrialization. They're going to be a force to be reckoned with. Um, the difficulty of getting into college in China makes it such that their students start off much better prepared than ours. And um, that's, that's going to affect us in the future. Uh, Thomas Trenaker asks, what is the highest wavelength that interferometry, interferometry is practical? And so I guess for anyone who doesn't know, interferometry is where you, you take two, uh, two telescopes and you combine their light separately, kind of mathematically, so that they act as if a, they're, they're one really big telescope. And I guess the, the shortness of the wavelength makes it more and more difficult. And so with radio wavelength, we have these, these wonderful telescopes worldwide telescopes where you've got one radio telescope on one side of the Earth and another one on the other side of the Earth and they work just great. As you make shorter wavelength, the timing gets more and more difficult. So what do you think is the practical limit of, of interferometry? Um, with given technology today, we, we are pushing into the near infrared, but we haven't gotten all the way into optical light. So we're working towards that goal, but, but like, it's, it's exceedingly difficult. Right. So like the very large telescopes down in Chile, those are are near infrared, infrared yeah. right, when they're combining their light, yeah. Yeah. <coughs> Bless you. Excuse me, sorry. Um, okay. Um, who are your favorite astronomers and why? This is from Danny Murray. Oh. You want to go first on that one? Oh, no. Um, <laughs> let me think. I, so I'll go with Chandra Sekar, um, and, and then before that, Henrietta Lebet. Um Basically because the two of them were able to, to see the consequences of the science they were presented. So with Henrietta Lebet, she was this woman basically looking at a bunch of images, cataloging things, and she noticed a trend, and she was able to figure out the period distance relationship, period luminosity relationship uh, for variable stars based on just putting together the pieces of what she was seeing in the glass plates. And then Chandra Sekar had the most amazing time management skills of any human. If you, if you haven't read his, his biography, read his biography. He, he was someone who managed to 
teach classes that led to the majority of the students in the class getting Nobel Prizes. He, he was someone that was an editor of the Astrophysical Journal, which influenced how our field progressed. He did so many amazing things. And on his way to graduate school, as we discussed last week, he, he was able to figure out white dwarf stars had a limit on their mass on the way to graduate school. That's just awesome. I think, oh, sorry about that. Um, I would say that my, my favorite actually is Hubble. I love the stories of Hubble and how he was sort of this, sort of, he was like an Olympic class athlete at the yeah. same time. He was one of the cool guys, and yet he chose to go in and really get involved in astronomy and, and ended up sort of pushing our knowledge of astronomy further than almost anybody else did. And it was this, it was just to show that that you can you can still be kind of cool, but also be into uh, you know be into the the sciences. And I I really enjoyed that story when we did the well. Love and his night assistant Milton Hummison was a mule cart driver. So it showed that Hubble was willing to recognize that even someone who basically hadn't finished high school was capable of learning to do amazingly detailed work. And, and so I love this, this combination of one of the most brilliant scientists taking on someone who was uneducated but careful and, and did a good job and respected that enough to make him the night assistant and keep him the night assistant. Yeah. Um, and then I also... Um I think who else I really like the stories of, and I say Galileo. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's so obvious. And yet, Galileo was when you think about the kinds of discoveries that Galileo was doing at the time that he was doing them, he was seeing through the telescope objects in the night sky for the yeah. first time ever. And you know that he was the first person to say, "Let me take this telescope and let me put it into the sky and see what I'm going to see." And that was just that was just mind bending. And then when you add on top of that his his kind of uh, you know his attitude towards the the authorities at the time. I mean, if, again, if you read his book where he was sort of describing his theories, and you, he was he was set up this straw man argument with another persona, he, you could see his whole attitude towards the people who didn't who didn't want to sort of. Uh, close down what it is that he was talking about, and it's pretty fascinating stuff. And I think he had—he was very brave. I think is the way brave to the point of again, we're going to go back to the Big Bang theory, right? He was brave to the point of almost obnoxious. You know, he didn't care what you, you know, who you were and how powerful you were and any of that. He just wanted to make sure that he could think about the things he wanted, and you know, it was—it was the ideas that mattered. And he was willing to piss off anybody if necessary. So I think Galileo was, was pretty pretty brave on that. Or just, you know, had no concept of other human beings, you know. <laughs> but no filter. So I think it was great. Um, uh, so Teary Eyes Anderson asks, are there any gases that are heavy enough to stay at Mars creating a heavier atmosphere? So I guess that's the question, right? If we could replenish the Martian atmosphere, is there any gas that we could use that would stick around and provide and not get blown away from the solar radiation. Well, it it has a carbon dioxide atmosphere that it's pretty good at holding on to. It just doesn't have a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. Right. Um, and I guess we look at Venus. Venus is right next to the sun. Yeah. And has a very thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. It holds on to it no problem. Right. Yeah. It, so so all you have to do is put heavier a lot. Yeah. or heavier molecules, as the case may be. Yeah. Exactly. It, it's always going to have issues unless you somehow cool it off. It just it doesn't have a magnetic field. So solar radiation is, is going to accelerate particles. They're going to hit one another and fly away. So until you can get the, the magnetic core of Mars rotating to generate a massive planet-wide magnetic field... Yeah, that's just sci-fi talking. I know, I know. Isn't that the running man? I don't know. Um, no, not um, no, not Running Man. Um, there is a the rather one, horrible science fiction. No, no, no. It's the one where Arnold Schwarzenegger goes to Mars and and they're remaking it. Anyway, just read Red Mars, Green Mars, Blue Mars, but not in that order because that wasn't the correct order. I don't think. Uh, yeah, Red Mars. It is Red blue, Green Mars. Blue? Red, Blue, Green. Yeah, Red. They just go to Mars. Blue. They get the water happening, and then Green. They 
Okay, so read that series. Mars. It's yeah. everything you ever wanted to know about tele terraforming Mars and why space elevators are terrifying. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, would it be possible to land a spacecraft on the surface of a brown dwarf? No. Not it doesn't so much have a surface no. No. So landing not so good. Hovering kind of using rockets to prevent yourself from falling in. But I mean a brown dwarf the higher is higher levels of the atmosphere. Right. I mean a brown dwarf is like a really big Jupiter. Yeah. Like a really massive Jupiter. So you're going to have all the problems, you know, you're going to have a total recall people Think are making. That's right, total recall. Yeah. 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 So you're looking at you're looking at somewhere between Jupiter and a star is your brown dwarf. And so you know, you're not going to want to land on Jupiter, and you're not going to want to land on a star. You're not going to want to land on anything in between. Right. Total Recall. I can't believe I forgot Total Recall. I never watched either of the movies. Yeah. So you're fine. Um, so Thomas asks, oh, do you, is carbon fiber used in satellites today? Um, yeah, but I don't know what to what degree. It's not very protective against radiation. Um, so there's lots of good reasons to use carbon fiber. It doesn't weigh a lot. It's extremely strong. Um, but depending on the electronics that you're trying to deal with, it's, it's, it's not something you use for electronics, and you can't use it to do Faraday shielding. Right, right. And so that's part of it is that you want the equipment that you're going to be using to actually uh, to be able to help shield the spacecraft internally, yeah. Uh, Corey Wilder mentions that it was red, green, and then blue. Okay. And someone else, Adrian McGrath, noted that those books were so boring. <laughs> I, I, I can see that. They got more boring as you went, yes. but they're still so accurate. As the methodologies, yeah. And we actually yeah. did a whole episode on terraforming, mostly terraforming Mars. So yeah. you can dig back into our archive and, and we talk more about those specific details. Um, cool. Well, I think we're kind of out of questions now, so I think okay. we will we will wrap things up. And so there's a good chance we'll be recording on Wednesday, but no promises, but there's a good chance. Surprise. You know what's funny is we get as many people watching the surprise episodes, almost the exact same number of people that watch the surprise episodes as watch the ones that we have regularly scheduled. So That's because they're smart enough to follow us on Twitter or Google+. So if you're not following us on Twitter and Google+, you're missing out on good things. <laughs> Um, cool. All right. Well, thanks, uh, thanks everybody for watching. Thanks as always, Pamela, for uh, for bringing your gigantic brain. And uh, we will see you maybe on Wednesday, and if not, then we'll see people on Thursday when we do our weekly space hangout. And, and, and may all of the air conditioning for anyone who has temperatures above 27 C or high 80s, which is what we have, may your air conditioning work. <laughs> all right. All right. We'll see you later, Pamela. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye bye.